Our most kind, gracious Father in heaven, again, we just thank you so much for your invitation that we can come before your great throne of mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and care for us, and we thank you for all the information you have given us in your word to prepare us for your coming. And we have been looking for so long for your coming, and we we hear your the horse's hooves already starting, and it's just exciting to know that we'll be going to home to eat with you soon. But Lord, our hearts need to be prepared first. And we know that you are preparing hearts. We see it all around. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us. And uh, just be with us tonight. May your holy angels be here and surround this place and fill this room with their presence. And your Holy Spirit to be here to um, inspire us with your truth, Father. And just be with me. Help me to speak your words. And um, just nothing more, nothing less. Just what you'd have me to say. And we praise you and thank you in the precious name of your only begotten Son, Yeshua. Amen. Okay, the coming great calamity. This last great crisis that is about to break upon our planet will come as a result of a sudden change in the way that God deals with the world. Who is prepared for the sudden change that will take place in God's dealing with sinful men? Who will be prepared to escape the punishment that will certainly fall on transgressors. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, yet he will not at all acquit the wicked. His forbearance will not always continue. We have been warned that terrible natural disasters will come upon the world just before the second coming of Christ. We hear now the earthquakes in diverse places of fires, of tempests, of disasters by sea and land, of pestilence, of famine. What weight do these signs have upon you? This is only the beginning of what shall be. John sees the elements of nature, earthquakes, tempests, and political strife represented as being held by the four angels. These wing, we, uh, winds are under control until God gives the word to let them go. The four angels which are standing on the four corners of the earth hold the four wind, holding the four winds are now ordered to let these winds begin to blow. These would be the first four trumpets which brings devastation on earth. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of uh, strife no, as no pen can picture. It is extremely important to an interpretation of the seven trumpets to understand that the coming judgments of God will be the result of a sudden change in God's dealing with the world. Only since the 1980s, with the help of modern technology, could anyone really understand the literal meaning of what the first trumpets could possibly be? The first four trumpets of judgment. The time is at hand when there will be sorrow in the world that no human bomb can heal. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn. Disasters by sea and by land follow one another in quick succession. How frequently we hear of earthquakes and tornadoes of destruction by fire and flood, with great loss of life and property. Apparently, these calamities are capricious outbreaks of disorganized, unregulated forces of nature, wholly beyond the control of man. But in them all, God's purpose may be read. They are among the agencies by which he seeks to arouse men and women to a sense of their danger. A global earthquake marks the beginning of the seven trumpets. This powerful earthquake will get the attention of the whole world. There is no parallel in history for an earthquake of this magnitude. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. When God's restraining hand is removed, the destroyer begins his work. Then the greatest calamities will come. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third of the trees 
the third part of the trees where it was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded. And a third part of the sun was smitten. And a third part of the moon. And a third part of the stars. So as a third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it. And the night likewise. These first four destructive events, expression of Yah's wrath, but mixed with mercy, are deliberately designed to harm the earth, which has been the object of man's worship, to save Mother Earth. These devastating plagues will awaken and get the attention of every person on the planet to the reality and holiness of the Most High Sovereign King and man's accountability to Him. These coming judgments will forever change life as we know it. Every infrastructure created by man worldwide, banking, economics, the communication, manufacturing, travel, shipping, etc., will be fatally wounded. These four judgments will be so catastrophic that they will sever the past from the future. They will cause the whole world to relate to God in a way that is presently unimaginable. The first four trumpets describe terrible eco, ecolog, how you say that? ecological I just seen if he's awake. disasters. Furthermore, these disasters affect the Earth's ecology in the very way that the human race today is so profoundly concerned about. We are concerned about the pollution of the Earth and the forests the sea, the sources of fresh water, and the atmosphere. After the global earthquake, the first uh, trumpet event will be global showers of burning hail, flaming meteorites, burning up one-third of the trees, and destroying most crops around the world. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. John describes the first trumpet as hail and fire mixed with blood. Hail. There are two possibilities for the hail. It could be either a shower of meteorites or a broken up comet. The meteor shower occurs when the earth passes through the trail of debris left by a comet or asteroid. Meteors are bits of rocks and ice ejected from comets as they move in their orbits about the sun. The idea that the hail in the first trumpet, trumpet might come from a broken up comet may seem somewhat far-fetched. However, evidence does exist to support this conclusion. Asteroid expert Eugene Shoemaker said, should a comet break up and fall to Earth, it would be as a giant shotgun shell of com cometary debris. Fire. The fire associated with the hail in John's vision is easy enough to understand. We have all seen the fiery streaks made by shooting stars. Large meteorites would create huge fireballs. Blood. We should understand the blood that John saw to be some red substance, not actually, actually blood. Meteors are sometimes observed with red, yellow, or green trails. The colors are caused by the ionization of molecules, like oxygen, which appears to be green. A fireball is a meteor that is brighter than the planet Venus. 
John said that the hail and fire mixed with blood burned up a third of the earth, a third of the trees and all the green grass. To the person who is uninformed about the consequences of asteroids and meteorites striking the earth, it seems incomprehensible that a single natural disaster could literally burn up a third of the earth's forests. However, a shower of large meteorites or a single large asteroid could easily destroy far more than a third of the Earth's forests. The following statement is adapted from a, a few paragraphs in the 1989 issue of Nation, National Geographic. The article is about the effect of a single six-mile asteroid impacting the Earth. As much as 90% of the world's forests would burn up, the fireball would have a radius of several thousand kilometers. Winds of hundreds of kilometers an hour would sweep the planet for hours, drying trees like a giant hairdryer. 2,000 degree rock vapor would spread rapidly. It would condense to white hot grains that could start additional fires. In addition, lightning discharges like those of a volcan volcanic eruption could ignite windswept fires on all land masses. The question above um, are describing the worldwide devastation that would be caused by an asteroid six miles across. The destruction caused by the first four trumpets is much more limited as only a third of the earth, the sea, and the trees, etc., are affected. If the first four trumpets indeed describe uh, future meteorite, asteroid, and comet in impact on the earth, then the asteroids and comets would have to be smaller than a six mile in diameter. Consider the horrible implications of all the green grass being burned up. Grains are grasses, wheat, corn, rice, oat, barley, millet, etc. If the first trumpet describes a future meteorite shower and its consequences, we can conclude that the world's grain crops would be destroyed the year it happens. And Jesus said, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. The judgments of the wicked cities. The idea of corporate interse uh, intercession may be a new thought for some. An important difference exists between God dealing with corporate groups, such as cities or nations, and God dealing with individuals. For example, consider Sodom and Gomorrah. When these two cities became vile beyond recovery, he destroyed them for their, their, their degeneracy, while um, preserving a few individuals, namely Lot and his daughters. When the two citizens of these cities filled their cups of sin, God exercised wrath corporately against those cities. But God did extend mercy to Lot and his family. This event shows that God deals with corporate sin separately from individual sin. The world is filled with transgression. A spirit of lawlessness pervades every land and is especially manifest in the great cities of the earth. The sin and crime to be seen in our cities is appalling. God cannot forbear much longer. Already his judgments are beginning to fall on some places, and soon his signal displeasure will be felt in other places. The angel that stood at my side declared that the Lord has appointed a time when he will visit transgressors in wrath for persisting disregard persistent disregard for his law. When God's restraining hand is removed, the destroyer, Satan, begins his work. Then, in our, great, our cities, the greatest calamities will come. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. I am bidden to declare the message that cities full of transgression and sinful in the extreme will be destroyed by earthquake, by fire, by flood, 
Calamities will come, calamities most awful, most unexpected, and these destructions will follow one after the other. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, one after another, upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of stupendous interest are right upon us. Strictly will the cities of the nations be dealt with, and yet they will not be visited in the extreme of God's indignation, because some souls will yet break away from the delusion of the enemy and will repent and be converted, while the masses will be treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. There are many souls to come out of the ranks of the world, out of the churches, even the Catholic Church, whose zeal will far exceed those who have stood in rank and file to proclaim the truth heretofore. When the crisis is upon us, when the season of calamity shall come, they, the souls of the other churches, will come to the front, girt themselves with the whole armor of God, and exalt his law. Isn't that awesome? These statements show that the trumpets of judgment happen before the close of probation, for there are still souls who will repent and be converted. At this time, the merciful hand of Yeshua is still reaching out to save others. Earthquakes. Wouldn't you like to be in that building when it went over? <laughs> Whoa. Out of the cities is my message at this time. Be assured that the call is for our people to locate miles away from large cities. One look at San Francisco as it is today would speak to your intelligent minds, showing you the necessity of getting out of the cities. Earthquakes in various places have been felt, but these disturbances have been very limited. Terrible shocks will come upon the earth, and the lordy place palaces erected at great expense will certainly become heaps of ruin. The earth's crust will be rent by the outbursts of the elements concealed in the bowels of the earth. An impressive scene. During a vision of the night, I stood on an immense, which, from which I could see houses shaken like a reed in the wind, Buildings, great and small, were falling to the ground. Pleasure resorts, theaters, hotels, and the homes of the wealthy were shaken and shattered. Many lives were blotted out of existence, and the air was filled with the shrieks of the injured and the terrified. The awfulness of the scenes that passed before me, I cannot find words to describe. It seemed that the forbearance of God was exhausted and that the judgment day had come. The angel that stood by my side declared that God's supreme rulership and the sacredness of his law must be revealed to those who persistently refuse to render obedience to the king of kings. Those who choose to remain disloyal must be visited in mercy with judgments in order that, if possible, they may be aroused to a, real, a realization of the sinfulness of their course. So this is in mercy and in love that God allows us to come to wake people up. Because if, if things keep going like they are right now, even if it's still bad, they're going to continue doing what they're doing, you know? But this will wake us all up. Great balls of fire. The Lord calls for his people to locate Away from the cities, for in such an hour as ye think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from the heavens upon these cities. Proportionate to their sins will be their visitation. Last Friday morning, just before I awoke, a very impressive scene was presented before me. I seemed to awake from sleep, but was not in my home. From the window I could behold a terrible conflagration conflagration. Great balls of fire were falling upon houses, and from these balls fiery, fiery arrows were flying in every direction. It was impossible to check the fires that were kindled, and many places were being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. 
God is withdrawing his spirit from the wicked cities, which have become as the cities of the antediluvian world and as Sodom and Gomorrah. The time is near when the large cities will be visited by the judgments of God. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that would should after live ungodly. The second dream. Last night a scene was presented before me. I may never feel free to reveal all of it, but I will reveal a little. It seemed that an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed large houses. From place to place arose the cry, The Lord has come, the Lord has come. Many were unprepared to meet him, but a few were saying, Praise the Lord. Why are you praising the Lord? inquired those upon whom the coming sudden destruction. Because we now see what we have been looking for. If you believed that these things were coming, why did you not tell us? Was the terrible response, We did not know about these things. Why did you leave us in ignorance? Again and again, you have seen us. Why did you not become acquainted with us and tell us of the judgments to come and that we must serve God lest we perish? Now we are lost. You know, this is a responsibility for every one of us when we will walk out here tonight is to let our neighbors know. Yeah, I presented this last week <laughs> with a group. They asked me to come up and I showed them this one. Does this not remind us of the story of Jonah? Jonah ran from the duty that Yah gave him to warn the city of Nineveh of his coming judgments. But when Jonah gave the warning that they must serve God or perish, they chose to repent and was saved. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of these coming judgments. But who is given giving to the accomplishment of this work with wholehearted service that God requires? If we believe these judgment, these trumpet judgments have all been fulfilled in the past, we have no bearing and has no bearing on us now, then we will not be given to the accomplishment of this work with wholehearted service that God requires. That means warning others. Their blood will be on our hands. Floods. I am bidden to declare the message that cities full of transgression and sinfulness in the extreme will be destroyed by earthquake, by fire, and flood. And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexities, the sea and the waves roaring. Mm. Notice that Jesus said nations will be in anguish and perplexity. Anguish means that this hurts a lot. And perplexity means, what do we do now? When Jesus said that nations, plural, will be in anguish and perplexity, he was talking about the international community, in other words, the entire world. What does it mean by the sea and waves are roaring? Roaring means echo. And it's from this Greek word, it says, to make a loud noise, that is, reverberate, sound roar or sound so this is to continue like a series of echoes now if you live close to the sea and you heard the sea having this eerie echo continually wouldn't that be weird whoa it'd be really odd the earth is feeling the curse of the sin and is echoing its sorrowful mourns these continuous eerie sounds of nature will be a constant reminder to the people that the earth is dying and in Psalms 102, 25, 26, and 27, it says, Of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shall, they, shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years have no end. Ear, but ere long there shall be such strife and confusion in the cities, that those who wish to leave them will not be able. We must be preparing for these issues. 
praise the Lord that he's revealing this now. Because if somebody's even in the cities or real close to the cities, you might be thinking, hmm, it's time maybe we better be doing something pretty quick. And the Lord will help you. I know he will. So just trust in him. As Jesus said, have faith in God, the Father, and he will guide you. This is the time that we need to be building our faith by um, trusting in him on all things. The end is near, and every city is to be turned upside down every way. There will be confusion in every city. The judgments will be according to the wickedness of the people and the light of truth that they have had. Wouldn't you like to be in that one? <laughs> Whoa. The ungodly cities of our world are to be swept away by the besom of destruction. In the calamities that are now befalling immense buildings and large portions of cities, God is showing us what will come upon the whole earth. When we shall see all these things, know that it, the coming of the Son of Man, is near, even at the doors. And the second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire. It was cast into the sea. Asteroid warning. The deadly reality of a catastrophic asteroid smashing into the earth has been revealed with a warning of consequences on a global scale level. It presents one of the most serious threats to the planet. The most lethal repercussions from a large asteroid impact would be wind blasts and shock waves. A spike in the air pressure could flatten buildings and forests. They add other damaging impacts, including intense heat, flying debris, tsunamis, and seismic shaking. From NASA's website, we read, we believe anything larger than a one to two kilometer, one kilometer is a little more than half a mile, could have worldwide effects. A 5.4 kilometer in diameter, the largest known potential hazardous asteroid is uh, Tautatus. Tautatus is a three mile wide asteroid. That's half the size of the six mile wide asteroid given in the scenario used in the previous example. And this is an actual picture of it. And here's some that I was going to show you, but it, we were not going to do that. <laughs> so what if Tautatus hits Earth? Tautatus would cause catastrophic damage if it ever did slam into Earth. In general, scientists think a strike by anything at least a point, uh, 0.6 miles wide would have global consequences, most likely by altering the world's climate for many years to come. And it could be this that sets us back up on the axis that took us off, I think, during the flood. So we can go back to the three, um, 360 day year, possibly. Ironically enough, this asteroid called Tautatus is named after the first Celtic god whose name Tautatus, also spelled Tautatus, means god of the people. He was worshipped in ancient Gaul and Britain and had been widely interpreted to be a tribal protector. The exaltation of nature above the god of nature, the worship of the crea uh, creature instead of the creator, has always resulted in the grossest of evil. Thus, when the people of Israel, in their worship of Baal and Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth, paid supreme image to the forces of nature, they severed their connection with all that is uplifting and ennobling and fell an easy prey to temptation. Why may the creator of the universe use this particular asteroid to hit the earth? In Deuteronomy we read, the, And lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. This is referring to the second commandment. If this asteroid called Tautatus is the one which strikes the earth on the first trumpet, the, the people of the earth who worships this tribal protector, God of the people, will be shown that he cannot protect them, but rather is used to destroy them. 
why uh, they will discover quickly that Jehovah, the creator of heaven and earth, is the master of the situation and the only true Elohim, which is to be revered, revered and worshipped. And I saw another angel having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Sudden impact. When the monster, now we're back to that six mile wide one, uh, made contact with the ocean bed, a hundred million megatons of energy would be released, eventually shaking the entire planet. In the passage of only three minutes, an expansion Expanding fireball of steam and molten injecta would level any city within a distance of 1,200 miles and, scurred and scour the terrain down to bedrock. Oh, that God's people had thus a sense of the impending destruction of thousands of cities now almost given to idolatry. Scientists have warned that a 400-foot tsunami could hit the east coast if an asteroid hit the Atlantic Ocean. And here's an article called End of the American Dream. And this is in 2020. We live at a time when giant space rocks are whizzing past our planet with alarming regularity. Sometime we know in advance Sometimes we know in advance that they are coming, and sometimes we don't. In 1998, a big Hollywood movie entitled Deep Impact imagined what would happen if a very large asteroid hit the Atlantic Ocean. In one of the most memorable uh, scenes in the film, a massive tsunami that is hundreds of feet tall slams into the east coast of the United States, causing immense death, and destruction. But that is just a movie. Could something similar actually happen in real life? A British news source reminded us that scientists have discovered that such a scenario is actually a very real possibility. A, com a computer um, simulation of an asteroid impact tsunami developed by scientists at the University of California, Santa Cruz, showed waves as high as 400 feet sweeping into the Atlantic coast of the United States. Dr. Ward explained that the 60,000 megaton blast of the impact would vaporize the asteroid and blow a cavity in the ocean 11 miles across and all the way down to the seafloor, which is almost three miles deep at that point. Such an impact would send a series of giant waves in all directions, including the east coast of the United States. Today, almost 40% of the U.S. population lives in a country that directly borders a shoreline, and the population density right along the east coast is particularly dense. We do not know which body of water this asteroid the size of a mountain is going to hit. The Atlantic Ocean seems to be the one most likely. It would have a greater amount of damage in reaching more coastlines both on the east and the west. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and all should be warned of these coming judgments. And the third part of the sea became blood. The National Geographic magazine explains how this could happen. The splash of an extraterrestrial impact, an asteroid six miles in diameter, in the ocean would bring up anoxic water from the depths. The sea would look like the aftermath of a global red tide, dead animals floating everywhere. Most of the world's fish would perish. Red tide. Red tide is a phenomenon that occurs fairly frequently off the coasts of both New England and the Pacific Northwest in the United States. Red tide is caused by a red organism so tiny that it can be seen only under magnific man. Somebody's gonna say this for me. My 
manification. I knew it. Okay, I like that one better. <laughs> Sometimes my tongue just gets twisted, and no matter how hard I try, it's not going to come out right. Okay, huge masses of these organism, organisms turn the ocean blood red, and they kill other any other living creature unfortunate enough to share their habitat. Most uh, significant for our purpose is the condition that causes the red tide. Red tide can um, survive only in anoxic, or that's oxygen depleted water. Water near the surface where the waves continually replenish the oxygen supply kills the organism. Thus, red tide can occur only under conditions that bring anoxic water from the depths of the ocean to the surface. And an asteroid stirring the ocean like a giant spoon would do exactly that. John's description of the sea turning blood red fits perfectly with the scientists know an asteroid impact in the ocean would do. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And here's all these sardines up on the bank. Isn't that something? And the third part of the ships were destroyed. If the six-mile asteroid hit the Gulf of Mexico, it would have created a wave three miles or 16,000 feet high. 900 miles away, the mammoth wall of water would still be 1,500 feet high. A tidal wave of that magnitude or even one caused by a much smaller asteroid would destroy any ship that was unfortunate enough to get in its path. Even a quarter-mile asteroid would create a tidal wave, wave hundreds of feet high, large enough to destroy ships and, and obliterate any coastal area that it washed over. Yes, they, the seas, and the waves shall pass their borders, and destruction will be in their track. They will engulf the ships that sail upon their broad waters, and with the burden of their living freight, they will be hurled into eternity without time to repent. Thousands of ships will be hurled into the depths of the sea. Navies will go down, and human lives will be sacrificed by the millions. This is incredible. I mean, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be it's sobering. Fires will break out unexpectedly, and no human effort will be able to quench them. The palaces of the earth will be swept away in the fury of the flames. Disaster by rail will become more and more frequent. Confusion, collision, and death without a moment's warning will occur on the great lines of travel. The end is near, and probation is closing. And the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it was a lamp. And it fell upon the third parts of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The third trumpet judgment speaks of a star that falls from heaven poisoning the waters and killing many people. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. So what does the name Wormwood mean? Wormwood means it's a type of bitterness that is figuratively a calamity. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the word bitter means to be embittered, that's literally or figuratively, and to be or to make bitter. Wormwood is an ancient word for a poisonous plant, which is used in Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 9.15, it says, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. So wormwood in Jeremiah is, means a curse. Wormwood regarded as poisonous and therefore accursed, hemlock or wormwood. And gall means a poisonous plant, generally poison even of serpents hemlock, poison, or venom. Their wine, and this is in Deuteronomy, their wine is the, the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. 
Who is the star called Wormwood that falls from heaven? It is the same star that falls from heaven in the fifth trumpet. And the fifth trumpet sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth. So what is his name? In Revelation 9:11, And they had a king over them whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So Abaddon in the Hebrew means a destroying angel. Abaddon concretely is Hades or destruction. And Apollyon is basically the destroyer. That is Satan, Apollyon. That means to destroy fully. And we'll be getting into five and six and seven tomorrow night. So when God's restraining hand is removed, the destroyer begins his work. Then the greatest calamities will come. The toxic rainfall resulting from the asteroid impact would defoliate any remaining land plants, acidify lakes, and leach normally insoluble, highly poisonous metals from soils and rocks, depositing them in streams and ponds and rivers where they would sicken or kill much of the surviving uh, aquatic life. The destroyer now targets a third part of the rivers, springs, and humanity's water supply by poisoning them with what the Bible calls wormwood. Here is an interesting article I found concerning the oil in the wormwood herb called Zujoni. You can read about it at this website. Um, it's, it's, it's this website that offers medical news, reference materials, and provides beneficial health information states that side effects may come from the ingesting of this oil in wormwood. Wormwood oil contains the chemical thujoni, which excites the central nervous system. However, it can also cause seizures and other adverse effects. They go into further detail on the symptoms one may encounter if this oil is ingested, including death. Wormwood that contains thujoni is possibly unsafe. When it is taken by mouth or used on the skin, when taken by mouth, thujoni can cause seizures, muscle breakdowns, kidney failures, restlessness, difficulties sleeping, nightmares, vomiting, stomach cramps, dizziness, tremors, changing in heart rates, urine retention, thirst, numbness of arms and legs, paralysis and death. And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars. So as a third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. What does it mean that the sun, moon, and stars are smitten? Smitten means to pound, that is figuratively to inflict with calamity, and then also to thump or pummel by repeated blows, beat, smite, strike, wound. So pummel means to hit or strike heavily and repeatedly. This seems to be indicating that the sun, moon, and stars will also be struck heavily with repeated blows from possible asteroids or some object, from, uh, with such force as to cause them to go dark for a third part of the day and the night. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Shaken means to waver, that is to agitate or rock, possibly from the base of um, 4525, which means to um, vibration. So can you imagine looking up there and seeing the sun, moon, and stars going like this? And I think that'll get somebody's attention. The tempest is coming, and we must be getting ready for its fury. By having repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord will also arise to shake terribly the earth, and we shall see trouble on all sides. And an angel, and I beheld, and a heard an angel flying to the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by the reason of the other trumpet voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. And we'll cover them tomorrow night. I hope you all sleep well.
<laughs> when I when I first did this, I mean, I was so sober when I got done with this. You know, I was thinking about this all day long, and then Jack gets home, and we go to bed, and so I start telling him. He says, "Well, what did you do today?" And I said, "Well, I did this. You know, I finished this presentation." And he says. Well, tell me a little bit. And I started telling him, he said, well, now this is the time you need to tell me this when I'm trying to go to sleep. <laughs> but anyway, and it's not funny, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's very sobering um, to think that this is actually before us and it's not that far away. And um, God is trying to get our attention and wake us up because he loves every one of us and he wants us to be saved. But we have a responsibility because once we know we have information, then we are to share it with others the best way that we can. I know it's going to be hard, but that's okay. We're not doing it. You know, the Holy Spirit and God through us will do it. We just have to be willing vessels. So we will have our prayer, and then you all can go to sleep. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for being with us and for the privilege of knowing and understanding these things beforehand so that we can prepare and prepare our loved ones as much as we can and those that we come in contact with. And please give us understanding and wisdom to know how to do this the best that we can. And um, we just pray, Lord, as we all go our separate ways right now, that you will bless each dear soul here, that we will sleep well because we know that you're with us and that your angels are with us and your sweet spirit. And so we just thank you for your love and mercy and kindness to us. And uh, may we have a refreshing sleep so we can wake up in the morning ready to go for another beautiful day of these uh, feasts. And all the information that we learn in the singing and just the joy of visiting and spending time with one another. In the precious and holy name of your only begotten Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask these things. Amen. <laughs>